Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 10th episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Eric Heyman. Eric is a partner and the CEO of Austin Asset, an independent RIA in Austin, Texas, that provides comprehensive financial planning and investment management to 300 clients with more than $750 million in assets under management, charging a combination of AUM and standalone financial planning fees. What's interesting about Eric, though, is not simply the story of the very successful advisory firm that he's helped to build, but his own path going literally from being an unpaid intern for the firm's founder 20 years ago to becoming its CEO today. And so in this episode, Eric shares his perspective on the the entire journey from what he actually did to land that first unpaid intern job and and then a few months later persuade the founder to finally start paying him a modest $18,000 a year salary to why the founder decided just a few years later to sell 10% of the firm to Eric when he was only 24 years old, and the challenges that the business faced as it continued to grow over time, culminating in the founder retiring and exiting from the business and selling the remaining shares to Eric and two younger partners. We also talk quite a bit about the book that Eric co-authored about his succession planning experience, aptly called Success and Succession, and how even though most succession planning advice focuses on the, the financial and the operational issues of succession planning, it's ultimately the emotional challenges, both for the founder and the successor, that are really the hardest to navigate and solve. Remember that you can find more information about all of our episodes, including a link to Eric's excellent book in our show notes. Uh, since this is episode 10, you can find all the show notes for this episode at kitsis.com slash 10. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoy this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Eric Heyman. Welcome, Eric Heyman, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Hey, Michael. How are you? Thanks for having me, bud. I'm excited you're here. You you have one of the coolest stories, I think, about a path in the advisory world that is, frankly, pr- pretty different than a lot of others that have come through. You know, you you basically climbed this ladder from intern, I guess, un- unpaid the firm's first unpaid intern to its CEO, and uh, buying out the founding owner and taking over the business entirely. And and I just I'm so excited to have you share this story and and what that path looks like for all the listeners for the podcast. It's a fun one. It's a fun one. I look forward to it. It's a heck of a journey. <laughs> it's a heck of a journey. So. Maybe you can start by just painting the picture for us of Austin Asset Management, your your firm as it looks today. So how big is it? Who do you serve? What is What does the business look like? Sure. So the, the firm now, there are 16 of us in the firm. Of the 16 folks in the firm, 12 of us are CFPs. So a very heavy concentration on financial planning. Do manage money for clients. So we have about $750 million we manage for a little over 300 clients. So that puts the average client just north of two and a, two and a quarter in terms of the assets we manage for them. But we're very much a wealth management firm that does the financial planning for all those clients. And so firm just crossed through the $5 million revenue mark in the last year. So some nice milestones have occurred just in the last six to 12 months with the assets under management reaching the 750 and the revenue finally crossing over the 5 million. So that's kind of how we sit today. And we take on two, maybe three clients a month and we're very deliberate about who we take on. And most of them are folks that are just at a point where they, they've reached a level of complexity where they're not really sure if they can handle it on their own and they reach out to us. And so we've been a benefactor of that being in Austin. You know, it's Austin shows up on a lot of the list of top places to be. And so that means that the hundred people a day that move to Austin. If we pick up one or two of those a month as a new client, then that's great. So, I mean, two to three clients a month at two plus million dollars a clip is is a heck of a lot of organic growth. So, where, where does that where does that come from? Like, how do how do you find clients, or how do clients find you? Like, how do you power this kind of growth? So, it it really goes back to the. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's the rising tide is raising the boats here in Austin. So, when I, I'm I'm an Austin native, so I was born here, have lived here most of my life, and 
you know, this was a small, sleepy college university, you know, state government capital town when I was a kid. And as high tech grew in Austin, I mean, people were moving here because of cost of living. And so when I joined the firm in 97, as an unpaid intern, you know, the firm at that point was essentially had revenue of about $150,000 and was the founder and a helper that worked with him in the firm and, you know, less than 25 million under management. And so it was really just a neighborhood uh, solo practice. But in the late nineties is when Dell computers, a lot of other high tech companies started really getting a foothold in Austin. And it meant that people that were looking for kind of fee for service advice as a fee only firm, there really weren't many choices. And so we just benefited from being one of the first firms in town and the, and the founder of the firm, John Henry McDonald had gained a fair amount of accolade for being one of the first fee only firms in town and had made it on the worth magazine list and other medical economics and things like that early in the day in the late 90s that made it so that when people looked for a fee-only financial planner in the early days of the internet, we were basically the the big firm in town or the really the only firm in town that would do it. And so the way it works now is we just have all that goodwill that's built up in Austin with existing clients and centers of influence around town that have also benefited from the growth in Austin to the point where there's about a hundred inquiries a year that come to the firm of which 60% are actually qualified for what we do. And so then we meet, we meet with a good portion of the 60 of those and we find two or three a month that, that will hire us as a client. And, and, and part of the hiring us as a client is also we will do financial planning for clients without managing their money. So we will do the consulting work that we used to do in terms of how the firm was built. So not all of those clients that hire us end up being kind of a wealth management client, but the majority do. So can you talk to us a little bit about what the, what those fee structures look like? So you, you said there, you, you'll do plans standalone, but you also manage assets. I'm presuming there's an AUM fee there. So what is, what is your fee structure look like? How do you price financial planning and wealth management services? Yeah. So I'll, uh, I'll start with how we got to this point. Cause it's actually kind of a, a good story. So you know, the firm was founded really doing hourly project work for anyone that maybe had credit card debt to, you know, questions about retirement. And so when I joined the firm, that was essentially the culture of the business, which was we wanted to be a, a real live consulting firm for people that were willing to pay a fee for planning, for financial planning. And so along the way, we actually resisted managing money for clients till the late 90s. And clients started asking us to manage their money. So in those days, what we would do is we would charge a, a fee for the planning, an hourly rate, essentially, for the project. And we'd design a scope of the are- agreement. And, and then we would manage money for clients free for a year, essentially because we were just trying to help them get organized. And then after doing that for a number of years, it became we might charge a $2,500 or $3,000 financial planning fee. And then we would give them a credit for half of the planning fee towards their asset management fee schedule. And then that evolved to the point where we dropped giving the the credit at all to entice them to have us manage their money to where we would charge a standalone planning fee anywhere from four to eight thousand dollars for a six month engagement where we would, you know, have five or six meetings going through all the areas like the CFP board would tell you in terms of the scope of their agreement. And we would charge those fees for planning and and then clients would decide during the scope of that kind of work. It's evolved to the point now where most clients, we ask all the clients to go through that study and whether or not they're, whether they desire us to manage their money or not. And so the fees will usually range now from 2500 to $8,000 now that we have a bit of an emerging wealth kind of a Henry, kind of high earner, not rich yet type of offering where we might charge them $2,500 for a modified kind of a smaller plan all the way up to the the client that's got multiple entities and, and many tax returns and property all over different states where we might charge them eight or ten thousand dollars for uh, the consulting. So does every client have to buy a financial plan for twenty five hundred to eight thousand dollars before they can become an asset management client? Or is there an option if they say like, hey, I got a couple million dollars dollars and I just want to do everything with you? Can, can they do everything at once or do they still have to go through? planning first with planning fee and then AUM second with AUM fee if they decide to go to step two? In most cases, clients will present themselves as this. Something hurts. They just know that we will provide a good service to them because they're referred in most cases. You know, Almost all the clients, those inquiries are, are referrals. So they know that for some reason we'll be able to help them. But they don't really know exactly what we do. So in a lot of ways, the planning was meant to be the easy entry to 
I'm not sure if I'm convinced to have you manage my two or three or four million dollars. I want to find out what you do and what kind of recommendations you design. So a lot of times clients will say the planning is the way for them to kind of get their feet wet with the relationship and then decide to have us manage their money. There are a number of clients that will show up and say, I've heard about you. I like what you do overall. I have $5 million at XYZ brokerage firm. I would like for you to take that over as well as do all this planning work for us. In those situations, we don't necessarily charge a separate planning fee because they've already decided they want the the entire offering. Um, and so the way it works out is over the course of a year, there's usually half to two thirds of the clients that will pay the separate planning fee. And then the other third or so may not because they're already predisposed to the full offering of, of doing the, the planning kind of on a parallel track with the wealth management. Interesting. So, so for a lot of your clients, the, the plan, the standalone planning fee and option is, is almost kind of a, a tasting menu option of, you know, if you're trying to get someone that, that moves literally millions of dollars, it's such a weighty decision for them that doing planning work for them first or, or answering their, their particular pain point issue from a planning perspective is, is what lets you work with them to build the trust to ultimately get the point where they want to become a more holistic and ongoing relationship. Yes, that's, that's exactly how the firm grew and that it was a way for us to kind of endear them to us because we would give them objective advice in a way that they hadn't received it before back in the early kind of days of my being here with the firm. And so it was a way to kind of differentiate ourselves because we'd actually do the consulting without managing your money. And now it's turned into that's where a lot of the goodwill and trust is built and saying that, you know, here's the work that we're going to do for you over the next, you know, six months. During that process, you'll, you'll get recommendations about investments and all the other areas. And there'll be a point where you'll, you'll likely look up and realize that, A, we're, we're more cost effective, but we also have a stronger kind of value proposition in terms of we're going to be doing the planning as well as the, the wealth management for you. So it's, it's, you know, we still, we still try and tweak it a little bit as it relates to the, the, the emerging wealth clients, but it's part of how we built the firm is, is be able to do the consulting for clients that don't actually have us manage their investments. Cause there are a number of do it yourselfers that still want to manage their own money or they're a small business owner that doesn't have a lot of wealth yet, but they've got complexity and they are looking for objective answers. And so if, if we can provide that, then we feel like that's a good, you know, service to the community as well as ourselves. I mean, it's a good, it's a good work for us. So. And, and I'm curious though, is it good work for you? I mean, you know, I, I, I know what the metrics look like when, when clients come on board for $2 million and stick for the long run and, and pay AUM fees and it's recurring revenue. And, and, you know, I know a lot of advisory firms that have just said, you know, getting the long term clients is such good business that, I just don't want these standalone project fees. Like you know, it might be decent time for, you know, fee for service hours, but it just doesn't grow and scale my business in the same way as getting long-term clients and, and saying, you know, you got to work with us with everything or we don't want to work with you. Do, do you ever think about going that route or you're not convinced of that or like what, what's your view on it? No, we, we, we are definitely, we deal with that tension on a regular basis and, and here's where the tension shows up. It's, and you have a mature, like I said, there's 12 of us in the firm that are CFPs, but only seven are kind of lead planners, if you will, lead advisors. So there are five that are in either support roles or in more kind of tactical portfolio type of roles. And so for us, the tension is those that are already planners, it's much better that, are, that they're more mature in their practice or more mature in their experience to only take on clients that are long-term clients. The challenge is, as, you're, as we're building the firm, at least when I think about how I learned, most of the best learning I had was on those early engagements where I was proving my value through doing really good consulting, like giving advice. And it made it so I could convey the value of a long-term offering to that client. And not every time, not every client would engage us long-term. And so in some ways, by doing the consulting for us, it's still our proving ground. It's a way for a new planner that maybe only has three or five years of experience that that might not be able to convince that you know, if they're, let's say this planner is in their, you know, thirties to be able to convince that client that maybe in their late fifties or sixties that it's time for them to move over their life savings to them as an advisor. Well, if they hire them for a four thousand or five thousand dollar planning agreement and spend six months with them, very quickly the, the planner on our team will learn great skills around how to 
identify problems and, and, you know, design solutions and things like that, that in some ways it's like the residency where doing those, you know, just, you know, being in the room, observing, writing the recommendations, looking at the files makes it so that when that client does present itself that says, you know, I've got the $3 million and I am prepared to hire you for everything. You, you have a, you have much stronger answers to their questions because you've done the consulting where you had to prove your worth, I guess, in a different way. So we, so again, like I said, there, you know, it's, it's about half the clients that last year there were eight of the 30 something clients that did planning only. So there were, there were two a quarter the way it averaged out. And, and the reality of that is it's, it's, it's good work, not for maybe a mature planner because they already have their skills, but it's great work for someone that's just beginning to transition into being a lead advisor. And so that's how we, that's how we utilize a lot of the planning work is having the, the newer advisors either partner with a more senior planner in the firm or at least with the team approach to where they can learn how to, to give really, you know, good answers to people that, that want objective advice. Well, and it's always been an amusing thing to me that, there are a lot of firms that do ongoing investment management and financial planning. So, I mean, they, they do have the financial planning angle, but but they they only want to do it for ongoing clients and not as one-time project fees. Yet, I know so many planners, I guess in, in, in essence, including your firm, that, that start on the hourly end and often end up pivoting into doing assets under management because the, the story is virtually always the same. You know, you're, you you work with some clients on an hourly basis and they come in and they ask you questions and you help them with stuff and then they come back in to meet with you maybe in a year or two and you're basically telling them to do the same things you told them to do the first time a year or two ago because they didn't do them. And and then maybe either in that meeting or maybe you go through this once more another year or two later and eventually everyone kind of realizes like I keep telling you to do the same thing. You keep not doing it. And the client at some point says, oh, can't you just help me and do it for me? Like, I trust you. I've been working with you for a while now. Can't you just do it for me? And and the project planning work ends out setting up actual asset management clients anyways. I I think the 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 tension or the other tension is you know, consumers, I think, are increasingly savvy about what's going on. And so you know, giving away planning as a loss leader to get assets, I, I think is probably not as effective as it once was, but just charging for, I mean, just charging a full on market rate. So, you know, client can be confident that, you know, th this isn't a pitch for assets guys is planning. This is actual planning that you're paying for, but they have a good, they pay for it and they have a good experience and the good experience that they have says, you know, maybe I do want to work with you with more and they turn into full scale ongoing wealth management clients. Well, later. I'll, I'll tell you that's exactly the case. And I mean, you, you, you're, you're spot on in that, you know, the, the reason we started managing money was because clients would go back to their bank or brokerage firm or, or try and do it themselves. And they would look up in a year or two and then call us back up saying, well, you know, I went to my advisor that was at, you know, XYZ bank. And, you know, they tried to do what I asked them to do, but they wouldn't do it the way you suggested. Well, so there's this tension around, you know, the model that was outside of our firm versus the model that we were representing. And clients would come back and say, well, will you please just do this for me? Because I don't want to go back and try and coordinate this with the three different, you know, investment advisors I have outside of you as my consultant. And the and the wild thing happened, you know, interesting thing happened to us kind of in the mid-2000s in that we had received this referral from a really prominent estate planning attorney here in Austin. And the reason he referred the client to us is because they already had four investment managers, but they didn't know what everything was doing. So he basically, he hired us for the client, brought, introduced the client to us because he wanted us to basically organize what was going on with their outside managers. And these, he had all the big names that you can imagine nationally. This was about a, you know, about a $30 million client. And this was the biggest client we'd ever seen. And, but we were just hired for planning. So we charged a really large, you know, a, a large planning fee because it was a really big project. Well, today, nine years later, we manage all their money. But it started off as just a six-month planning engagement. You formed your own little niche for yourself around actually being the fee-only objective planning-only folks in a town that at least at the time really didn't have many others doing that? Right. That's exactly right. And to this day, there really aren't many firms – in Austin that will do the planning without managing the investments. And so we still, that's, that's a, that's a majority of why we still have the, the, the goodwill that we have is because we'll still do it. 
for clients that don't necessarily want to move their investments to us. So, so, so what about on the asset side itself? So planning fees vary from $2,500 to up to maybe 8,000 or, or, or more if there's more complexity. So with an average client that's close to $2 million, like do, do you have a one or $2 million minimum for doing asset management in the first place? So we don't, we've, what we've, what we've gone to is we've, we've tried to go back to the, the early days of the firm, but also look at the runway of the firm. So I'm 42, been here for 20 years. And when I, and when I joined the firm, our average client was, you know, barely probably $150,000. When you think about when you, when you finally started managing money for clients, that's about how big our average client was. So you can see that the, you know, the average is quite changed, right? Well, the same phenomena is occurring now in that, you know, we still have a really long runway as a firm. And so in many cases, we want to still attract clients that have great potential that they can be part of our firm for a long time, just like the clients that hired us, you know, back in the late nineties that now have become, you know, two and $3 million clients today. And so we don't really have a minimum. What we try and do is just gauge the complexity as well as the potential of what's going on in the client's lives to see if we can provide value. So, you know, we'll take on clients that might only have three or $400,000 that are in their thirties because they're in great professions and they have great potential and they're just really great people to work with. And we know that as we endear ourselves to them over many years and they work with one of our newer planners and they kind of learn together that they'll make a great client, you know, 10 years from now, just like the ones that I started with, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And so we, what we try and do is, we work in these collaborative teams to the point where there are, there are four roles assigned to each client. And so you can imagine that the largest client has the most senior people in each of those roles. And the, you know, smallest client of the firm might have the most, you know, inexperienced or junior people in the firm in those roles. And so the, that's the way we just, we just try and manage the human capital that way, as opposed to saying, Oh, our minimum is 2 million. And we're not going to take on a client, you know, unless they have $2 million, because there are clients that have more than $2 million that are bad clients for our firm. So interesting. So it's like, it's, it's a, you don't necessarily segment drastically different services to clients based on their wealth level. You segment the experience of the advisor and support team that works with them. Yeah. So think it in some ways as, I mean, I, I use this term, I don't think it's a real accurate term for it, but it's what I call it. Essentially, a, it's a cost accounting. So if my most senior people are working with the most senior clients providing the most uh, complex work, then that's kind of how we structure that. And if the the newest CFP with the newest team member that's in this in, in at least experienced person in terms of their career track is working with the smallest clients, then in some way I've segmented the clients by who serves them. And yes, there's a slightly, there's, you know, slightly less complexity or less uh, work that goes into that client that's paying $4,000 a year compared to the one that's paying 40. But we, we try and segment it based on how the teams are designed as well. So, but we don't have a true like segmented, you know, like a tier one, tier two, tier three type of client. Well, it's an interesting point because I, you know, I, I spend a lot of time talking about serving younger clients as well. We, you know, it's kind of our focus for what we're doing XY Planning Network these days. And I know, you know, we get lots of questions from ex- from existing firms. That's basically something the effect of I I I don't I don't understand how any of those XY Plan Network advisors can make any money serving young clients. They just don't you know they don't have enough money or they don't pay enough to justify it. And and the and the comment I usually have back to them is we what what do you pay your advisors? And you know sometimes it's big numbers and and you know particularly when you get into firms that historically have done a lot in. The high end wealth management space, you know, they might have advisors that make $150,000 with bonuses or 200 or 250. I've even seen higher numbers than that. And so, you know, it comments them like, well, why don't you just hire a 27 year old planner with a couple of years of experience, pay them $70,000 to $80,000 to sit there and just be an awesome service person? For young clients, like if you if you had a planner that you only paid seven or eighty thousand dollars, do you think you could be profitable charging two thousand dollars a year to a hundred young clients? Right, it's two hundred thousand dollars of gross revenue. Your 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 gross margin is going to be sixty percent after you pay the salary. You know, allocate a little overhead, and like there there's your there's your profitable young client. And and I think we like we sometimes get ourselves trapped in the idea that we we can't serve small clients because it's it it wouldn't be cost efficient given what we pay our our 
senior advisors and, and kind of forget that like, not every client has to work with the most senior advisors. And the deeper your team and the more you just segment your client services by the experience and basically the cost level of your advisor staff, the, the more room you have to to serve a wide range of clients and, and have them be profitable up and down the spectrum. It's not that like your high-end clients get super fancy services and elite client events and all that while your lower-end clients get you know one meeting a year if you deign to meet with them. It, you know, you can serve them similarly up and down the spectrum. You just do it with people that have a little more or less experience overall and and segment by staff. Yeah, I completely agree. That's 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 one of the biggest things that I think folks that have when I think of a firm that's gone from an average client like we've had to our average client now, part of what begins to kick in is this idea of just the pride and ego of having an average client of two and a half million dollars or whatever. Yeah, you know, you could be at like two you could be a two and a half or three million Eric if you didn't keep screwing it up by taking on young. That's right. Well, the other part of that, what shows up in that is the opportunity cost because the most senior advisor is thinking, well, I don't want to work with those clients, so why should we take them on? The challenge they're, that I think what they're missing is exactly what you laid out, which is if you want to build an enduring business, you're going to attract and hopefully bring people into your firm that don't have the same experience you do you know, 20 years later. And what a great way for them to begin to learn the craft, if you really care about teaching them, you know, how the, how a firm works, but by working with people that are much more closer to their age, they're much more closer to their level of kind of net worth or complexity. Because when I, when I think about it now, I'm having lunch with a client here pretty soon. We just confirmed everything on the last day. He was one of the first clients I worked with and they had barely a hundred thousand dollars. Now, the great thing is they're only, they're like essentially my age. So they, they hired us for basic planning Back, you know, 18, 19 years ago when they were in their mid twenties. Well, now they're in their mid forties and they've got $3 million. So, so it's like, what's my opportunity cost? My opportunity cost is actually not taking that client on that has the potential. You're not always going to get it right and they don't always become $3 million clients, but I haven't, there are a number of those clients that have, that have been part of our firm for 12, 15 years that started off with, you know, 10% of our average client now, and they're better than average clients now. And so I think it, but I think it has to do with the approach of the firm. And so if you're just looking at it from an opportunity cost of your most senior advisor, I completely agree. The challenges, the way our career tracks are designed and our pay grades are designed that we hire people that, that don't have very much experience that are going through the process of getting their CFP and then they get their CFP. And there's this huge chasm between getting your CFP at 28 years old and working with a client with a $5 million net worth in my view. And so now what have I done? I basically set them up for failure because I've said, oh, well, you got to work with clients that are twice your age that have, you know, incredible net worths that you've never been exposed to before. Now, now go, now go get three new ones. Right. And so, and when, so when clients reach out to our firm because they want planning, if I can design a team that can service most of the needs of the clients that are presented to us, then I think I, we can grow a really great business and, and provide opportunities for that planner that makes 70 or $80,000 to then get to the point where they might make 150 as they grow in, they grow into their own experience in their own firm. And so, cause they don't have to go out and do business development. So that's the other part of this is that, you know, our advisors aren't asked to go out and do business development because we have these, these great inquiries that come in. Now they're rewarded if they do it, but the culture of the firm is meant to service the opportunities that present themselves. And so the, my job, I think of as CEO is designing the service model that can design the team that can work with those clients that maybe you're only paying four or $5,000 a year in a way that it, it's really good learning and it's really good experience so that in two or three years, that planner can then sit in that new client meeting with the one that is an ideal client. So talk to us a little bit about how you got started down this whole path. I mean, you said you've, you've basically been at the firm for 20 years since the late 1990s. You're 42 now. So you like – do you start right out of school? I mean, how how did you land in in financial planning or financial advising or financial services? What, what, what were you even looking for when you first got going? Yeah, I, I wasn't looking. I was a completely delusional college kid. So I was. Both my parents had backgrounds kind of in accounting, and and so my junior year, I decided I wanted to do an internship in an accounting firm because that was the most natural extension of what my parents had done, which was, okay, go work in accounting in some form or fashion. So I went and did an internship at an accounting firm. And I liked about 5% of it. And the other 95%, I'm like, why am I sitting here doing this during my summer? Like, I'm just, it was, it was just, it was mind numbing to me. I just, 
I didn't enjoy most of it, but there was 5% I really liked, which was the modeling and the scenarios and running the financial kind of tax models, right? Just different scenario analysis. So I ended that internship after, uh, whatever, four or five months from the spring to the summer. And I went to my kind of career counselor person at the University of Texas. I had one year left of school. And I was talking to them about this and I thought, well, gosh, I thought I was going to go into accounting. I'm not going to do that now. So now what do I do? And he had this, and he was, he was great because he had this conversation with me where he said, you know, well, you've got this one elective space that's open. And there's this class I heard about that you might really like. It's called personal financial planning because it's got a little bit of business law, which you liked, and it's got a little bit of tax in it. And I've heard people get really good grades in it. And I thought, well, fantastic. I'm going to sign up for that. So I signed up for this personal financial planning class, class at the University of Texas. And lo and behold, it was taught by Vicki Hampton, who now runs the one of the best financial planning programs at uh, Texas Tech University. And so Vicki was my professor, and I showed up for class. And within the first three or four weeks, I, I went to her after class and said, do people really do this for a living? Like, can you actually do this for a living, like where you actually do financial planning? And she said, yes. And this is in 1997. The challenge is, she said, most people that do this are actually selling products And they're not really doing a lot of financial planning. And they go, well, that's disappointing. And she said, but I have, I'm on this committee for the CFP board where we're working on the CFP exam item writing committee or something. And, and I've got a list of people that are helping me with that. And if you, if you, if you'd like, I can give you their information. You can call them to see what a real CFP does on a daily basis. And I thought, fantastic, because this accounting thing wasn't going to work. I wasn't doing any job interviews. And my parents thought I was crazy for thinking that waiting tables was going to be the right idea after college. And so. I started calling people down this list and most of them worked for big banks or brokerage firms or insurance companies. And so I would call them and say, hi, you know, here's I am. Can you tell me what a CFP does on a daily basis? And they did, most of them didn't have time for me or they didn't return my phone call. That was the one strike. The second strike is when I would talk to them, most of them said, oh yeah, we've got opportunities for, for new entries. We take on 10 people every three months and one might survive. And I'm like, oh, I don't want a sales job of cold calling. You know, like how to... No, tell me about the net worth of your friends and family. <laughs> exactly. And so then it, so then I got a hold of John Henry McDonald. And so I called him and I said, okay, so here's my name, da, da, da. He called me back. I was like, well, that was the first one of those. And he called me back and said, hey, I'll spend, you know, 15 minutes with anybody talking about anything. And I thought, okay, he's crazy enough to worry to actually do that. And so we scheduled a time for me to go meet with him. And this was in the spring of 97. So right about 20 years ago, it was in March. And so I went to go meet with him and he gave me, you know, we set 30 minutes time. And so we talked and asked him about what he did. And he talked about how, you know, he was against, you know, he he had decided to go fee only the year before and why he did that and why he was charging, you know, hourly rates and, and project fees like a law firm or accounting firm and how he was, he wanted to be a professional and not a salesperson anymore and all this. We ended up having a two hour conversation. And it got me really interested to the point where at the end of the conversation, I was like, do you mind if I just come here after class or on my days off? Because I think at the time I had like Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes. And so I thought I can come on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you know, and just, do you mind if I just come to your office and just observe to see what you do? And you can said, I just show up? Will you, will you let me show up and not kick me out? Because at that point I was... I didn't know what I was going to do. Like I was going to be finishing school and I had no, all my friends were doing, you know, interviews at all the big accounting firms or consulting firms and all the stuff I thought I was going to do. And I didn't want to do it. And so I thought, well, Eric, you've got to figure out something because your parents are going to think you're, you know, you get a degree and you're still waiting tables. And so I went, so he said, you know, I can't afford to pay anything. And I'm like, I'm not asking you to pay me anything. I just want to come to your office and just learn if this is something I really want to do or not. Because that accounting internship I did where I got paid, like I knew that I didn't want to do it anymore. And so that started the process where for four or five months I would come in on my off days of school or over the summer I would work, I worked full time almost at the office and then I would wait tables at night so that I could just learn what a CFP really did to decide if it was something I wanted to do. And so I did that for four or five months through most of the spring and through the summer. And, and August came and I had one semester left and so I was going to graduate in the fall and I, I went to him and I said, okay, I've, we're four or five months into this. And one of the neatest experiences he and I had was my wife and I were engaged. We we're about to get married and uh, my lease was ending at my apartment. And so I wanted to buy a house for us to live in. And I had two friends that needed a place to live. And so I went to him and said, you know, John Henry, I, I'm waiting tables, but you know, my income that I show for waiting tables isn't very much because I'm a waiter. And, but I want to buy this house. And so could you at least commit to paying me 
$750 a month for me to work in your office so that I can add that to my income so I can qualify to buy this house to rent out the two rooms to my friends so I can live there for free until I get married. And he, and, and basically he, he, he told me later, he's like, I would have paid you, but the fact that you put the proposal together, like I still have the proposal on a one sheet of paper. I kept it because I thought it was just such a neat thing where I laid out the fact that I had, and at the bottom paragraph, I said, you know, I, I have some real opinions about what I think we can do with this business and how I think I can improve it. I think you'll definitely get your money's back, your money worth of paying me $750 a month. And so he, he agreed to pay me the seven fifty a month while I was still in school until I graduated in December. And then to pay me full time eighteen thousand dollars a year once I graduated December, and so I bought the house. I bought the house, ran out the two rooms, lived there for free until my wife and I got married the next year. And it was very much a I just did anything I could in the office. You know, it was back when you had paper files, and so you're a whole lot of copying, a whole lot of organizing, a whole lot of just being a gopher. You know, doing anything you could in the office to be valuable. And my my idea was, if I could prove myself valuable for nothing, then eventually he will pay me something. And and the way it worked out was if, if I could serve him in ways that made his day a little bit easier, then eventually he wouldn't want to get rid of me. And that's, and that's essentially the story was that that's, that it just evolved like that over time to where he would then give me more little projects to help him out to where then we could, we could, we could do a little more planning than he was doing before because now I was supporting him. So there's a little bit of leverage, right? And so that just, it snowballed, um, to the point where he agreed to pay me the, the full time salary and then about, 18 months later, we, I, t- I went to him and I said, look, I need, we need to hire another person to do what I was doing for you 18 months ago because I think we can actually leverage that person too like you leveraged me. So, so yeah, so, so it was, that's how it worked out. And how big was the business as this was happening? Like how, how big was this practice? Yeah, there? so in 97, our, our revenue as a firm was about $150,000. By the end of 97, I think we were managing about $25 million. And so there were maybe about 100 clients. 120 clients, something like that. And these were clients, when I say 120 clients, these were probably 70 of, well, not 70, probably 50 of those were that year one-time financial planning engagements, You know, whether it was hourly or it was a project or it was a full plan. And then there were probably 60 or 70 that were kind of asset management where we were just starting to manage money for clients. So back in that day, it was if I could provide structure to help him, because he was a he was so great with relationships. I mean, his his genius was that he knew how to talk to people about doing financial planning and how he had a radio show. Like I said, he was on Worth Magazine. He had he had done a great job of creating a, a name for himself in the firm. And what he needed was just someone to follow him around and, and kind of pick up the crumbs. I mean, essentially just to come behind him and organize his thoughts. In ways that right. would be leveraged to, to do more of what he was already doing in a way that was more efficient. Which I think is a pattern we see in a lot of advisory firms, right? Like they, they get, they get founded by someone who's particularly good at business development and they survive. Cause if you're, if you're pretty good at business development, like you, you get enough revenue coming in that you can pay the bills and you will survive. And then that works up until a point where I guess even as John Henry was like you, you, you get somewhere up around 75 to 100 clients and you start getting closer to capacity, particularly if a lot of it is one-off business and reactive business because that's, that's very hard to manage and systematize. And and you start hitting a wall where you, you need a little bit of help. And then you – that you know for that that's kind of the first crossroads of are you going to start hiring, try to build a business that's at least a little bit beyond just your individual capacity to do all of the work to serve clients. Right. And that, and that's, you're exactly right. And I think that's where I was so fortunate in that he was comfortable letting go of that. Like very early on, I think he, he knew where his skill set was, which was, he had great awareness about that. He knew that he was, he was much better on, the front end. And we had this, we, we had this silly expression that essentially was he knew how to catch the fish and I knew what to do with them. I mean, that essentially was it. I mean, it was, it was as though he was the fisherman that took the boat out and caught the fish. He'd brought him back to port and I operated the restaurant. And that's essentially how we grew the firm was he knew how to create really great interest in the firm and activity. And then he would essentially turn it over to me with open hands saying, okay, you figure out how we're going to do this and who, who we're going to hire what we're going to pay them, what we're going to actually ask them to do, what's the, what's the deliverable and how are we going to bill for it? And, and do we, are we going to have agreements? And so just think of everything that was done before was very one off. How do we create systems for it? So does that feel weird that like the, 
The dude who'd built the business and was bringing in all the clients was asking 22-year-old you what to do for all these people to get paid? Well, it was... In some ways, it, it is now when I think about it in the rearview mirror. But at the time, Michael, it was I was ready to help, and I think part of it was having little victories early on during that kind of unpaid internship. Was I? There's a there's a concept that I that I talked about that that John Harry and I really shared was there was this idea of emotional deposit. So early on, me working for free for him gave me great deposits into him to support him. So when it became time for me to kind of exercise a little bit of my thoughts about how to improve the business, he could kind of look back at that experience and go, you know, this kid may be crazy, but he came here and worked for free. And so I'll give him a little, I'll give him a little area of the playground to try it out. And, and in some ways he just, he expanded the playground. He just gave me a few more toys and a little bit more, a bigger part of the sandbox to, to design things. And, and, and so what I became was this researcher. I mean, I would get my hands on every single benchmarking report, every single article I could get about practice management. I would attend every conference that I wouldn't go attend IRA distribution sessions or estate planning sessions or, you know, investment sessions. I would go attend all the practice management sessions. And so I became essentially kind of a practice management student early on because I didn't know. I, did, I hadn't worked in a business. And so I, I, I really just tried to compile as much information as I could from the best minds that I could find about how they were running firms five or 10 times the size of our firm. And then I would bring it back and say, look, this isn't my idea. Here's these three firms that do it this way. If it's working for them, maybe we, sh maybe we should, con should consider it. And I guess it's an interesting distinction, right? Like you weren't coming back and, and saying like, hey, you know, since I've got 11 months of experience now, let me tell you how I think we should reform your business. You know, it was – Look, I, I, I'm going to conferences and I'm reading the industry benchmarking studies. And I'm reading the industry research and here's the best practices that I found across the industry that I think we could apply here and I want to help apply them. No, that's exactly right. And, th and that was the only way I felt like any of my ideas had credibility was if I could prove that they were working in other, other environments that he would respect. Meaning, you know, back to those early days, you know, as a smaller firm – that was on the Worth magazine list. I mean, it was a huge accomplishment. We were the only firm in the Austin area that was on that list. Well, most of the firms that were on that list were much more mature than we were, much larger businesses. So all I had to do was, not all I had to do, but the idea was I would go to the firms that were on that list, learn about how they were doing what they were doing, and then go back to him and say, look, they're on the list too. What if we tried doing things that they're doing? And he would, he would, he was so open to it because he conveyed the same credibility on them that he was experiencing by also being part of that group. So it made, it made my job easier than it really would have been if I'd have been going, well, this is my great idea for how to pr improve your business. It would have been, it would have come off pretty arrogant. But I, I think it's a fascinating takeaway for maybe young person, young, young people who are listening to the podcast as well of, of just that journey of, you know, I wanted a good opportunity. So I just found a person said, I'll, I'll, I'll show up for free if I have to, because I just want an opportunity to contribute and help because the inevitable outcomes, if you do a good job of that, you know, reciprocity rule kicks in. Like people like to try to do thing, do well by people who do well by them. And so, you know, your, your unpaid work for John Henry ultimately got you a job with him and the, the, work that you did got you the credibility to be able to influence the firm more and do more positive things over time. And you put in the work and did the hours to come to the table with actual external. I, I mean, I'm sure your own ideas as well, but like validated externally so you can make your case up the line. Yeah. I think that's the, that's the part for, I think for the next generation of leaders, that's really, it's an area where you can, expand your voice in a way that doesn't mean you actually have to have to have the experience of being in the real seat, but there's so much great information that's out there that can be gleaned at conferences or from benchmarking studies or just articles around practice management where you can begin to connect your own dots around how to apply those within your firm. And I would say most owners of firms, they're, they're not thinking about working on their business very much. And, and so there's a, there's an aspect of, there's an, there's an entry point where the barrier to entry is, it's not like there are professional managers of most firms that are, are registered investment advisors. They're usually advisors that became managers of their firms because the firms got so large. And so in some ways, I, I could go out and do the research and, and make myself 
sound like I was 10 years more experienced than I was because I just compiled the information that others were were sharing how what was working or what wasn't working in their firms and go back to him and say, what if we try this? And I would try low, low risk experiments, right? You know, just, you know, what if we tried it this way? Um, and one of the first ones was just getting people all on the same fee schedule because he had a lot of different handshake agreements with lots of different clients. Particularly when you're working, when you're growing the business from scratch, right? You, you, you do whatever you can. That's, and, and, and that's exactly right. And so you kind of just start navigating those life cycle type of discussions around, formalizing your fee structure or formalizing your reporting or formalizing the process of doing financial planning, all those things. I just gathered those from firms that were, you know, much larger than us and appealed to the fact that he wanted to grow a larger firm. And, and you're, and you're right in that. I think in a lot of ways, most firms could, could, could market themselves by creating opportunities for employees as much as whatever their pay is. And that, that's how we've tried to position our firm. Meaning we, we, we aren't we aren't in the biggest markets and we aren't the biggest firm, but what we try and provide and we talk a lot about is the opportunity that you have. And in and so in, in a lot of ways for employees or people that are interested in getting to the business or younger advisors, identify a firm that is very attractive to you and be willing to, to work for the opportunity as much as you're willing to work for the paycheck. Because in, I think in a lot of ways you'll be rewarded for making yourself valuable. Maybe you don't become the CEO like I did, but I would have been happy, you know, with where I was, you know, just making into being a full paid, you know, planner a few years later, you know, I mean, it didn't have to, I didn't, I wasn't, the, the prize wasn't to become the CEO. So, so, so you got started there in 97, you kicked off as an unpaid intern, the firm had $150,000 of revenue and was just starting to do this assets under management thing. And you, you, tried to help John Henry starting to make a few of these changes and, and systematizing the practice. So, so what did the, what did the trajectory look like over the next couple of years? Like how did, how did the firm grow? How did your role change? Sure. So when, so like I said, in 97, the idea was I, I was essentially coming behind him learning, not talking very much at all, but taking tons of notes. Right. And his, his nickname for me was radar. So it was kind of like I carried around a clipboard like radar from mash and I would just take notes of everything. Like I would just, I would just, you know, the man of few words, right? It wasn't cause I was trying to be EF Hutton. I was just trying to take down a lot of notes and I would carry on this clipboard, so to speak in his eyes. And I would just, my, my idea was just to look for all the little things that were going on and try and connect the dots. So by, you know, 97, then you start looking at 98, by the end of 98, I'm looking up and realizing, wow, we could actually hire, you know, hire another planner. What would that look like? And, what, do we have enough work for them? And so by the end of 99, we had gone essentially from a, a team of three in 97 um, to a team of six in 99. And the firm's revenue had tripled. And that was just you're freeing him. You're freeing up his time more and he's going out and developing more business. And this and this AUM thing is starting to work. So what it, what had happened was is we had essentially quadrupled the amount of planning we were doing. And more than doubled the assets under management revenue. So essentially creating leverage on the planning to quadruple the amount of planning we were doing in 97, 96 and 97 meant that now all those opportunities, like we talked about at the very beginning, became opportunities to then manage money. So, you know, now taking on that many more clients for planning meant that now we had that many more opportunities to manage money for clients. And so by the end of 99, so we hit this crossroads in 99 for me, from my career. And so at the end of 99, we looked up and realized that, okay, there's, there's six employees now, including myself, and there's kind of a real life business that has to be, you know, taken care of. And so by the end of 99, we had about $50 million of assets. So we had, you know, more than doubled the assets and, and tripled the revenue over the course of those three years. And the decision was, does Eric keep focusing on being someone who takes care of the business or does he start utilizing his CFP? Because I just passed the CFP at the end of 99. So I'm 24 years old, about to turn 25. Do I become a lead advisor or do I become the business manager? Is essentially the conversation we had at the end of 99. And what we determined was I could go charge $200 an hour as an advisor, or I could go spend an hour working on the business. And these are John Henry's words that would make him $10,000. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know which one he wanted you to do. <laughs> and so, so I became essentially the managing partner, if you will. And I bought 10% of the company from him at that point. 
you you bought in 10% of the company as a 24 year old. Yeah, I just turned 25. And so at the beginning of 2000, we signed all the documents into 99, beginning of 2000. And I, I bought 10% of the company from him at the end of 99. I'm curious, like, how do you, how do you, how do you price that? Like, how do you, how do you afford 10% of that company in 1999? Like, granted, it was, it was $50 million AUM and not like a billion dollar firm. Like, that's a, it's a big ass chunk of money for a 24 year old. So, I mean, did he, did he, did he just give it to you and said, you're making my business bigger, be my partner or, or did you buy it? What did that look like? So it was a little bit of yes and no. So, you know, the firm's revenue was, you know, 150 when I got there. Uh, we were at 450 when we closed the door in 99. And there was this conversation that was brewing amongst us where he, he had a desire to build like this premier financial planning firm in Austin. And I really thought I could help him do it. And so we kind of locked arms in that, in that, from that discussion. And there was another person that was involved in the firm and they were focused more on the investments. And so when it came to the business, the business decisions, those started just showing up on my desk, you know, well, how do we want to hire this person? And what would, we, what would their job description be? These things are started showing up on my desk, kind of like COO, head of HR, all those kind of deals. By then I'm in charge of QuickBooks. I'm in charge of HR. I'm in charge of, you know, all these things. And, and so we ended the year and I said, you know, John Henry, I think, I think we have to decide whether you want me to do what you do, which is being an advisor. And we hire a replacement for me to like be a bookkeeper, office manager type person, general manager of the business, or I become that person. And so we look back to the story and said, you know, I think it's much easier for me to find someone to be an advisor as opposed to find someone to do what you bring to the firm as a kind of a COO type of person, general manager. And so at that point, we looked at the the, the agreement and, and he ended up selling me 10% of the company for one times revenue. For one times revenue. I'm going to imagine a few, like a few listener jaws just hit the floor. Like he, he sold it to you at, call it roughly half the going rate out there for for buying books of advisory firms. Or at least the rough rule of thumb is about two, two times revenue and you got to buy for one times revenue. That's right. And, and, and I... And as I, even when I say it, I feel a little bit embarrassed about it, but I also know the story, which was, this was a firm that he had operated for 10 years. I mean, he had founded the firm in 87. Now it was a different firm, meaning it was a lot of commission work that became more fee work and then it became more, you know, completely fee work. But you you have to go back to that position and say, okay, it was $150,000 a year business. And three years later, it was a $450,000 a year business. It wasn't like I did all the work. I just helped him create systems so that he could be better at what he was doing and then hire other people to leverage them, to understand, to provide them opportunities. And so in some ways, I think he looked at the one times as, wow, like I'm, I'm going to keep this person from leaving and going somewhere else. And it was still a small business. So it was still an unproven asset. Like this wasn't a, a business that was worth millions and millions of dollars. So when you, from, from that perspective, the business was probably worth I mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe a half a million dollars. Cause again, most, uh, you know, half the revenue was planning revenue. So it wasn't recurring. I mean, it was one time revenue. So when you think about it that way, it wasn't like it was all AUM at a, you know, two times multiple, a little bit more modest of a, right. of a discount. Yeah. You know, maybe, you know, maybe it was a, you know, 25 to, you know, 40% discount maybe because much of the revenue was planning, but it was still a material discount. And so that was the, the sweat equity, if you will. And, and the way we structured it was essentially, it was like a really big car payment I made each month. And, and he held the note and charged me interest and, and I worked to pay it off. And, and if we had any profit, you know, the next year, guess what? I got 10% of it. And, and I would use that to, you know, pay down the loan to the degree that I wanted to. But essentially it was like, I bought a really fancy car that year that I couldn't afford. But, but, but a car, but a car that pays a dividend, but a car that pays a dividend, which is better than a depreciating asset. That's exactly right. Yeah, so we ended the year in we ended the year in 2000. The revenue that year grew by 50% by well, the revenue that year grew by almost 50% in 2000 that year alone. And so we ended the year at almost just shy of 100 million in assets. So we, you know, at 90 million in assets. So we went from 50 to 90 in one year and revenue grew at almost 50%. So at that point you were feeling slightly better about your your car payment and Absolutely. Well, and and think about it and that's the that's the point that I I talked to kind of our peers about is, you know, the, the thing that you can convey to a founder or an owner is that 
No, there's a there's a degree that you gain from having someone else kind of rowing in the same direction. And I think what John Henry gathered by 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 him sharing the goodwill of a, a reasonable price with me meant that I was then very motivated to make good on that. And maybe that's just me, but I think a lot of people would be willing to do that. Meaning you 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 create easy terms to buy in and look what and there's there's a great possibility to grow the pie because now someone else is rowing in the same direction for the same reasons you are. And I think, and, and so he been, so I think in a lot of ways we both benefited from that because he was willing to do that. Well, and, and I mean, you just start doing the simple math right there, right? So e- even if we're just going to keep it pegged at one time's revenue to make, to make the math simple, like at the beginning of the year, he sold you 10% of the, of his $500,000 firm. So you bought 50 grand and he had $450,000 left over. And by the year, by the end of the year, revenue was up more than 50%. So his, Remaining four hundred and fifty thousand dollars share was worth six or seven hundred thousand dollars. Like literally in the span of a year, your ability to help grow the business or your your participation in the in in supporting the growth of the business more than made back not just the value of the shares that he sold to you, but I mean, or, or not even just like maybe the discount of the shares, but the entire value of the shares. Like he he sold you 10% of the business and he was worth 20 or 30% more at the end of the year for having done so. Right. And it was in, and, that, and you're exactly right. And I think that's the, that's his, that was his genius in a lot of ways was he was willing to try that. And I think that's, that was one of the things I'm most appreciative about the experience with him was that he was willing to give that a go. I mean, he, he sold me an asset that he'd had for at that point, 12 years, but it had grown in three times in value in the matter of three years. And then it goes up 50% the next year. And then by the time we end 2001, the firm had doubled from the time I had bought it. So we, so you think about that, the smaller piece of a bigger pie really did happen. Well, and it makes a powerful point that I still don't think is appreciated enough in, in the, in the advisory industry and landscape today. Like this is why growth matters. You know, there's often a lot of discussion of like, should we grow or not grow or like are people too obsessed for, for growth and you shouldn't grow for growth's sake and, and like we've got all these sayings out there. But this to me, like this is why it matters. Growth you know, does two things. One, it, it makes the process of adding new owners, adding new people, deepening your, your team, it makes it less painful or, or, or literally positively accruing because – you can have a smaller slice of a bigger pie and end out ahead, right? Like if, if John Henry was just sitting on his $50 million and he was comfortable and happy with it, he might have made a great income. I mean, you can, you can take home a pretty good number now, just sitting tight on even less than $50 million under management. But anytime you add someone to the picture when the revenue growth is stagnant, you know, every piece of equity you transfer to someone else is a personal loss for you. Every, every team member you hire is money directly out of your pocket and less in your take home. Whereas when you're growing, you know, in, in essence, you're, you're, you're giving up a portion of your future growth value. But if you do a good job investing into people and bringing them on, the people grow the business way more than what it costs you to bring them on, right? That's kind of the definition of a good, good investment or a good return on investment. And, and, and you can, you can sell pieces of the business or hire staff and, and, and quote, quote, unquote, give up revenue to pay your staff and still end up with more money and more value in the end. I completely agree. And I, and I think that's where, at least I feel with John Henry was he knew what he was really good at, but he also came to a point where he recognized that if he could leverage the talents of others, meaning finding people that are actually, I mean, he he used to make this comment. He's like, I want to hire people that are a lot smarter than I am so that I can do what I'm really good at. I mean, it's, it's the early strengths finders type of ideas. Like he knew what his strengths were, but he also knew what his strengths weren't. And and when you, when you do all the different kind of personality tests and all the different, you know, all the Myers Briggs, everything, he and I were complete opposites. And that was the, that was the beauty of it was that there was tension in that, of course, but there was also this appreciation for each other's skills that meant that, we could come together and work on things in a way that I think there are a lot of founders like him that are holding on to con- onto the control that aren't, that aren't, that aren't comfortable enough with their strengths to realize that they can't do everything. And I think there's a lot of successors or kind of next generation kind of advisors that maybe have skills that they could add value to the firm in, but they haven't, they, they, they could use a little bit more confidence to just speak to that, just to speak to that voice. 
in terms of a, a little bit of a matchmaking to go, this is how your puzzle piece fits into this based on kind of personalities and skills and strength. So how did this progress forward? So I, I, I know ultimately years later now, John, John Henry is retired. He's out of the picture. You're, you're running the business. So can you talk just a little about how ultimately that came about? How did that transition occur? What did that look like? He, he really, Jeremy's desire was to grow this, the kind of the premier financial planning firm in Austin. And so once we got through the 2000, 2001 period and the firm had, you know, just, you know, quadrupled in size of assets and revenue and all that by the time we got to 2001. And I was getting much more comfortable with my role. I'd been with the firm for four years by now. Uh, we ended up with this, this decision point. And the decision point was, do we align ourselves with who we've been, meaning a lifestyle practice that's kind of in the neighborhood, you know, that, that provides a lot of flexibility to him and to the advisors and meaning if there's not a client meeting, then you just didn't have to be at the office type of mentality. Think of like just a larger kind of lifestyle practice that all, that had, you know, six or seven employees total. Or do we really commit to building a, pro- a professional firm? And so in O2, it was probably one of the most difficult years because I, I, we, Jair and I sat down at a lunch shop and a little sandwich shop around the corner from our office and had this discussion around how committed was he to this vision of building the firm versus how committed to his lifestyle was he in terms of the flexibility he had. And what we came away with was an alignment around the idea of he really, he really was prepared to build the business, like actually really build a business. But that meant that that the third person that had been with him for a while that had also was a, a small, an owner of the firm we had to we had to have this conversation with him as well, and what we found in that conversation was he was much more comfortable with the lifestyle practice. So in in two thousand two, we bought out that third the shareholder that the the employee that actually been there before I was there that that had been working with John Henry for a few years, a number of years, because we were going to commit to building the business, and it meant that we we wanted to have full alignment. And he and he he was much more interested in you know if I could work thirty or forty hours a week and. And take three weeks off and not come in for a couple, and that, and that's fine. I don't, I, 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 I think that that is a, a completely appropriate model as long as that's what you want. The, the challenge we had was we had kind of two competing models. One was, here's the model that I'm bringing that Eric is trying to help me build because I say it's important. And here's the model of our past. And so in 2002, we really, we committed to growing a business where we would actually would, you know, kind of create an intern program and design a residency for planners and, you know, how they would get their CFP and all this kind of this whole career track was built in O2. We buy out this, this other shareholder that owned a small part of the company and we push forward. So O2, O3, O4, O5. Now the firm's right around $2 million in revenue, $250, $250 million of assets and a staff of 12 people. Now we're starting to hit some real growing pains around operations, HR. Uh, you know, hiring and staffing and service model and, and all those types of situations. And, and so by 05, he and I probably hit our lowest point uh, in terms of our relationship. And this is where Eric playing the, the de facto COO kind of CEO type of role, while John Henry was still in the CEO role, charged with, you know, leading all the st- strategy of the firm and where we're going. And, and John Henry was, is one of the most visionary people I've ever met. The challenge is he would have a lot of visions and a lot of ideas, and then I would be expected to carry them out. And so there would be this conflict around, is this just another new idea that you're just sharing with me on Wednesday, or is this something we're going to talk about again on Friday? And this is something we're really going to do. And I, and I think that's the beauty of an entrepreneur is that the business required that in order to survive its first 10 or 15 years. But we hit this life cycle stage in 05, 06, where the tension was, we need prof- we need to professionally manage the firm, but we also Jahari also really loves being a lead planner and a, a relationship person and being on the radio and being on the TV and being the face of the firm. And we ended up having an offsite between the two of us with one of our management consultants, where we essentially had to recommit to the needs of the business were more important than the needs of our ourselves. And the discussion revolved around the idea of if we're really going to push through this, then we need to have the the really difficult conversation about who's going to lead the firm and what are our roles going to look like. Because at that point in 0506, 
you know, we had about uh, 280 clients or so. And he and I were responsible for half of those, meaning the legacy clients, the firms, the clients that had built the firm, the clients we'd attracted from like 01 to 05, he and I would share those clients. So I was doing, you know, double duty as an advisor with him and leading my own clients as well as trying to run the business. And I was just getting worn out and, I, and he was as well. And, and so this discussion happened at an offsite where there were a lot of tears. There was a lot of elevated voices. There was, it was really difficult to the point where we weren't sure if we were going to go forward. But we aligned ourselves around the central idea of the needs of the business were more important than the needs of ourselves. And if we could commit to that, then we could work through it. So then in 06, we started working with the same consultant and we went through this book called Why CEOs Fail. And we did kind of a like the weekly Bible. Why, why CEOs Fail? fail. Mm-hmm. And it's a great book. It's written by David Dotlick and Peter Cairo. And essentially, it's the 11 behaviors that can derail your climb to the top and how to manage them. And so it's essentially a blind spot book. You know, here's the blind spots of, of CEOs that they think they're doing really good, but here's the 11 behaviors that actually, you know, hurt their businesses. And our, the consultant took us through this book as a way to recognize that I have, I have failures and John Henry has failures. But based on where the firm is, the, the needs of the business are likely in a position where the, the, the behaviors that John Henry has that might be hurting the business are really going to hurt us now compared to early on. And some of the strengths I have and some of the weaknesses I have, the weaknesses I have were his strengths. So those carried us to this point. So now if we're going to go forward as a real kind of the e-myth type of thing, like where we're actually going to manage and operate the business, it's maybe this is where Eric's strengths show up stronger and his weaknesses can be delegated or kind of diversified across the staff because we have enough employees. And so that took it, we went through that study in fall of 2006. He came into the office one day and we were both really kind of frustrated because we were were feeling the tension and, and the reality of this, what was coming. We were both kind of a little bit of fear and, and he came in and, and I, we, we sat down in, in my office and we had this conversation. I said, you know, John Henry, um, this is hard for both of us. And I care a lot about you and conflict to me, like embracing in conflict to me shows that you actually care. Uh, you know, avoiding conflict means you actually don't care enough to actually address it with a person, uh, and kind of work it, work it out. And so he came into my office and I said, you know, I, I can see that we're both kind of acting out in ways that aren't really productive um, for our relationship, me included, and you know, both of us. And and so I gave him a homework assignment. And I, well, I didn't give it to him. I asked him. I said, you know, would would you would you consider going home and going and talking to these five people? I mean, these these four or five people. These were a group of people that I knew. I mean, we we'd been working together by this point for you know eight or nine years. And so I knew who his circle of kind of support was, you know, spouse or counselor or friends and things like that. And would you consider going and talking to these four or five people about what you really want from this business and, and not come back into the office until you have those conversations. And it was one of the, you know, as scared as I was that day when we talked about committing to the needs of the business. And then as scared as I was when we had the offsite where we committed to committing to the needs of the business above ourselves, this, this homework assignment was, one of the moments where I, I made as many withdrawals out of that emotional bank account that I've ever made because it was essentially well, I mean, you basically called him out. I mean, is this kind of the, no, it was, it was, I, I hurt for him. Like I hurt for the situation that we were in. Like I, I felt as though we were both, we were both close enough to where we could self-destruct what we had built because we were both feeling the weight of it. We were both feeling how real, this business was, I mean, it had, it, it was an animal because I mean, like, of the complexity, because of the pressures, because of the, 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 it's, it's the, the staff and management, all of that. It was, you know, there were, there were 14, 15 people at that point. You felt like you were the dog that was chasing the truck for years that would run by the front of your house. And all of a sudden you caught the truck and all of a sudden you looked at when like, where's the truck going? And I think that's what, that's what the reality was for the two of us and was it's that like you, you wanted to be a big firm because it sounded cool to be a big firm. Then your big, big firm was like, holy shit, there's a lot of stuff to deal with now. What am I supposed to do from here? That's exactly right. And I think we were, we were having a bit of an identity crisis, each of us, in terms of I had been the de facto second chair the whole time I had been with him. He had always been the first chair. But each day, it felt more like I was supposed to be the first chair by making decisions and looking at what a CEO does and but yet that was difficult to address if we couldn't figure out a way that did it healthy. And so 
we had this homework assignment and, you know, and I, I was in tears. Like I was like, Jahari, I care enough about you that I want to get this right. And I think one way to get this right is for you to, you to help me understand what you really want, because that's what he'd always done. I mean, he, early on, it was like, here's my vision. Here's what I want to accomplish. Okay. Well, let me design the systems that support that. And so this was another area where I said, you know, just help me understand what you really want. And in, you know, in 06, he was, so let me think how old he was. So in 2006, he was 58, 59. So he was getting close to being 60. And, and so this was a bit of an identity thing for him too. Like here is this young kid that he had trained who was now essentially starting to take over the firm. I mean, by this point I owned, you know, 30% of the firm. He had sold a little bit more of the firm to me. And so it was definitely becoming this scenario where Eric is starting to have a larger voice in the firm and, but we hadn't designed a formal succession plan or transition plan. And so this was the beginning of it was this homework assignment. And he came back uh, about a week later, back in the office in Butch Mender Spirits and we debriefed. And, and what he came away with was he really didn't want to run the business anymore. And he really wanted the, the parts he enjoyed, which were being the ambassador and being the face and being the voice and, and being with relationships and, and all those things. But he was really, he didn't want to run the business anymore. And, and so in early, early 2007, we designed the, the transition plan and it started off with, an exercise that I, that I put together as a way to honor him, which was a, a, a few page document that basically said, you know, celebrating success. And it was essentially acknowledging all the, th- the great things that he had done in the firm, even before I had been here and all the risks he had taken and all the things he had done well. And then that was kind of the first page. And then the second page was then here's what the business needs for you, from you now, you know, and kind of outlining here's how you can make, Hey, here's how you can still do great things for the firm over this next part of your role with the firm. And, and I think that really helped because it, I didn't want him gone. Like I didn't, I mean, in in earnest, I did not want him gone. I was not prepared for him to be gone, but I was prepared to start having a larger voice in the things that I was already kind of doing in a de facto role. And so we designed the, this memorandum of understanding, we called it where, you know, he would, he would scale down. So you actually put it on paper. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the celebrating success was an exercise we did in, in the early part of 2007 and then by June, July, I think it was kind of late June of 2007, we had this memorandum of understanding, we called it. So it wasn't a binding document, meaning it wasn't like a legal enforceable document, but it was a memorandum of understanding that our attorney drew up with the help of our management consultant that basically outlined, here's the steps that we're going to take over the next number of years to address things like operational transition and financial transition and the roles and responsibilities and hours in the office and pay and all those things so that it would be a plan, like just like a financial plan for a client, right? We designed this plan in a way that would show how I would redeploy his income to capital improvements to the firm or, or hiring people and how that would show up as profitability to him. And so all these models were part of that as a way to make him feel comfortable in knowing that it was the right time to, to, to start the process of handing the baton off. And, and, you know, so like in year one, there was you know very few changes. And then by year two, we had transitioned you know, half of those clients that those half of those clients that he and I had that he was leading to others in the firm. So we had all these transition meetings and endorsing the team. And so we spent a good part of two years doing that. And by the end of the first two years, then we adjusted his compensation because he was no longer serving as, serving as an advisor. And then we, and then we, you know, adjusted compensation a couple of years later when he was no longer really in the office very much or managing the team or managing employees or responsible for, you know, and had he agreed to all of this up front in the memorandum? Like this was the deal. You're going to transition your clients over two years and then you're going to take a pay cut and then you're going to release some management responsibilities and then you're going to take a pay cut. And like that, that was all just laid out in the, in an agreement up front. Yes. So it, the spirit of it was certainly laid out and the specifics were part of the document. The way it happened did not look anything like the document. And what I mean by that is it actually happened faster. So the document was my, not my, the document was really the approach that I felt like was safe. So it was calculated, right? It was, I wanted to honor him, but I also didn't want to be so abrupt that I wasn't prepared either. You know, so part of it was I wanted some training wheels for a little while, you know, and I wanted him to feel like he, he still had a valuable role because he did. And so it was almost me saying, okay, Eric, what are you willing to, how far are you willing to stick your neck out? And so, and and so what happened was, is we thought the transition of clients would take three years. We actually worked through it in two. So that, that adjustment in pay happened a little bit sooner, but he was completely comfortable with it because now he had the discretion of time that was created because the clients had been transitioned. 
And was that the driver? I mean, it's hard to imagine very many people like, hey, I've got an awesome idea. Let's come up with a plan where I make less money every two or three years over the next couple of years. So you're exactly right if you're not growing the firm. So a big part of the a big part of the plan was, and this was, I mean, I'm completely comfortable sharing this. Was a big part of the plan was, you know, he didn't want his in, his overall income to go down. So like the pressure was on as long as you can grow the firm enough to make up salary cuts that he's taking, and he'll cooperate with this plan. Which which it wasn't that he would cooperate. It was that that was my that's what I had always done, and so I was totally comfortable with the idea of him saying, okay. If you're able to, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't quid pro quo completely, but a little bit of it was in that if I could redeploy income or, or let's say his, his reward for labor, right? So I think of reward for labor versus reward for ownership. So if, if we made adjustments to his reward for labor by adding an additional owner, which is what happened in 2007. So we added an additional owner who then took over the oversight and strategy for the planning department, which is what one of the areas John Henry had been kind of running. So they kind of then started leading this department together. If that provided leverage and growth to the firm to the point where at the end of that first year, revenue was up based on what we expected because we had created additional capacity and so forth, then he would be comfortable taking a reduction in pay because now his pay, his reward for labor, because his reward for ownership went up. And so the amazing thing that happened was from 07, he never had a pay, he never had a total income reduction. As he reduced his reward for labor and as he sold shares. Because the business, again, just this is kind of the crucial aspect of growth. Like the, the business was growing enough that his, and I guess that's the virtue of size, right? Like by the time it's a couple hundred million dollars, it doesn't actually take that much top line revenue growth and profit growth to make up a decent chunk of salary that you back away from. That's right. And so the, the way it worked out was, is, you know, after we transitioned all the, the clients, you know, he took about a 50% pay cut. And then as we transitioned all the other day-to-day responsibilities and to the point where he had, he didn't have, we didn't expect him to be in the office at all. Essentially, his job was to be an ambassador of the firm and be involved in partner meetings and things like that. But he, he didn't have to be in the office if he didn't want to be. At that point, he took another 50% pay decrease to where essentially we were paying him as an ambassador, a representative of the firm, like you, essentially like a staff person to be part of our story. And, and so that's how it, that's how it worked out for the last three years. And in those last three years, he spent four, you know, three to five months in another state because he had bought another home in a state he wanted to live in. And so he, he spent three or four, almost five months the last year in that state. And we'd have conference calls for partner meetings, but he wasn't required to be in the office. So paying him a staff salary and also getting really nice mailbox money in the form of profit distributions where your income never really went down. I mean, it was, it worked out really good for him and it worked out really good for us. His income stayed even. The business got to redeploy his salary for other growth angles and he got the time that he wanted for the, the stage of life that he was at. Right. And his, and his equity in the firm grew, you know, the shares that he continued to own continued to really grow. So was part of this agreement also that he was eventually going to sell at the end of this journey as well? Or was this just about, redeploying his time and the salary that went to him with the expectation that like he still likes this ongoing, as you put it, the, the mailbox money. You know, it's one thing to say like, we're going to dial down your job and dial down your salary, but you'll get more time and the mailbox money makes up for the salary you're not getting. It's another thing to say, and then you're going to sell the firm and there'll be no more mailbox money. So was that part of this plan and the, and the memorandum that you guys agreed to in the progression or – was it a separate conversation that came up about actually buying him out entirely? The plan advanced quicker than, than really any of us expected. And what I mean by that is the client transitions went really well. We added an, another owner in 2007, then we added another owner in 2010. And so you had this experience where we thought this was going to take a lot longer. And he was engaging in the experience as quickly as we were, meaning – he was willing to let go as fast as we were willing to take hold of it. And so there's this, this unique environment occurred where the plan we thought would be a lot longer. It became, it, it, it essentially was getting shortened every year. And we reached this point where we had to have that conversation. And, and so that conversation happened in 2014 where, you know, he was, he was out of the office for, you know, four or five months out of the year. 
we started realizing that he still owned enough of the firm to where we just couldn't reconcile the idea of having a passive owner. We thought we could. Like we thought when we designed the memory of understanding in terms of how long it would last and what it will look like, we thought it would be a lot, a lot longer runway. And when the, sh- the runway became shorter and shorter, and we were affirming that in him, like he was doing, it was great. Like it was, it was going so well that it was going quicker than we thought that we had the discussion around maybe it's time. And, and so we had the discussion in, in early 2014 and there was a little bit of the, you, you went through all those areas again, you went through the operational piece again, you went through the financial piece again, you went through the emotional piece and we ended up with kind of the, the, the conversation that by, you know, that June we bought the, the remainder of his shares and found outside financing so that he wouldn't have to hold the note so that he could receive a lump sum payment for those shares and we also designed into the, into the agreement to where there was a four year kind of revaluation on a portion of his shares to kind of let him ride along in the success of the firm or if the firm was, you know, purchased or something like that. So he's got some kicker that, so he's got some kicker that, so he's not frustrated. Like I, I sold it and then you guys grew the hell out of it and, and, and I, and I feel like I missed out and I'm angry. That's right. And that, 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 that was designed to also just address the idea that this wasn't like a, this wasn't adversarial. Like we weren't, we didn't want him gone. Like this wasn't like we didn't, I mean, I worked with him for 17 and a half years. I mean, he was in a lot of ways, my very first professional mentor. And so, but we'd reached a point where the life cycle, the firm was getting to the point where we, we need to figure out a way to redeploy equity and or redeploy kind of the energy of the firm in a way that how do we get to the next stage of growth? And, and so the one couple of things I didn't want to do. One thing I didn't want to do was have him hold the notes like which he'd always done when we had bought shares. Cause I didn't think that was right for him to continue to hold the risk while we're paying him out over seven years. That was one thing I didn't really feel right about. Um, if, if he was going to actually sell his equity, the other was I didn't want him to feel like we were going to turn around and two years later, flip the company and make a whole bunch of money. Cause we sold to one of the big rollups or something. <laughs> right. Like, Let's get, let's get that other dude out of the way and then we can sell for a roll up at a premium. Right. And so I didn't, I didn't like anything about that because I wouldn't want that to happen to me. Like it, when I think about myself, I wouldn't want someone to do that to me. So I didn't want to do that to him. So we spent, you know, four or five, almost six months trying to find an outside lender, which we found that wouldn't make him guarantee the loan. And so that was a win. And the other thing is we did, you know, designed in this, in the structure to where a portion of his equity was revaluated revalued four years later. And so we're 15 months away from that revaluation date. And and he'll get what right now is a really nice payout. And I'm completely fine with that because that was designed into the modeling that we did with him on the front end, which was, you know, if, if, if he's not earning a salary each year and not receiving a profit distribution, and we're paying this note to the bank for the lump sum that we paid him, then the economics work out to where we we would be willing to, we'd be certainly willing to give him a piece of the growth that the firm had, had achieved over that four year period as a way to kind of honor him being him adopting the succession plan in a very uh, expedient way. Right. Meaning because it, it went through, it went faster than we thought. And so having that kicker, if you will, or that second bite at the apple, as John Henry called it, we're completely fine with that. And so we just, we want to grow the firm and we want him to benefit from that because if we're growing the firm, then that means our equity is growing. Um, and so giving him a part of participating in that, I felt like that was an honorable thing to do. So, so, so I'm still curious. How do you, how do you broach that conversation though? Like, so John Henry, you've had a great run. You've been dialing down your time, but we're getting a little tired that you own so much of the shares and take so much of the profits and don't show up in the office anymore. More power to you, but we kind of want your shares now. <laughs> like, how do you? How do you have that conversation? Well, I'll ask you the question. So how how do you think I would do it based on how I did the other stuff early on? Well, clearly we need a consultant involved so that the, the recommendation comes from a third party. And and, and uh, a lot of research, right? So, and a lot of research, yeah. So there, aren't, there, aren't many, there aren't really many truly passive owners of advisory firms. I mean, in the true sense of the word, like, I mean – they're, they're still, they're still either rain making or they're still, you know, taking on a few clients or still going to lunch with clients or something. Even the ones that are the most passive that I've seen still have some role that relates to client leadership or client development. And so because of that, I think the conversation as uncomfortable as it was, I think he, he, he knew it was the right conversation. 
because he wasn't in the firm. He wasn't connected to the firm. He wasn't creating clients for the firm. He wasn't involved with, you know, mentoring or, you know, development of the staff. And so it was really difficult. I'm not, I'm not, no, you know, I mean, I think if we had gone the runway of the succession plan, it would have been another few years before we would have had the conversation. But because everything got shortened, like the life cycle and the, of all the decisions happened, you know, almost 50% faster than we expected, that it meant that we, sh- that we had the conversation sooner than we expected. And so mentally, it was a bit of a surprise to everyone. But I think once we had had the conversation a couple of times and the management consultant, as you mentioned, that, that was certainly involved was, was in a part of those conversations. I think we could pull back enough and go, what are the needs of the business, John Henry? You know, we, we agreed to the needs of the business back in 05, 06 when we were at our most, our lowest point in our relationship. Here we are not at a low point, but at really a high point because we've actually accomplished all the things in the memorandum that we had designed to. But it just means that now we're at the inflection point a little bit earlier than we all thought. And, and so we, you know, so we, I mean, we, we worked out an agreement to the point where we came up with these, you know, the, the solution, you know, to where he would have a, he received his lump sum. And so we got to, you know, so all the notes that he had had. So I had, by that point, just to kind of clear it up, I had paid off all the shares that I'd bought from him, which was 40%. Uh, but we had restructured the firm as a, as an S corp with two share classes, and so he and I were sharing control at this point. So the last, the last, almost four years of the of the succession plan, he and I shared control with voting control. So we each owned the same amount of voting shares, while the other owners in the firm were buying shares from him. He could still own thirty one percent of the company and have it be voting shares, and I could own thirty one percent and have it be voting shares. If that kind of makes sense. Yep. So so six. 62% of the shares had a, had a hundred percent of the voting power between you and John. Henry. That's exactly right. And that was a way for him to work through this succession plan where he and I share control until the point where we didn't. And, and so the nice thing was the last four years we shared control, but he never, he never, he never dissented. Meaning if, if I wanted to go a certain direction, he was, he was very supportive of that. And we might have a dialogue about it, but we never had a stalemate or we never had a, oh my gosh, we're completely on opposite ends of the spectrum because we were both willing to give a little bit. And so when it came time for the kind of the succession plan, it was kind of the, it was kind of the same thing where we didn't have to pay him a lump sum and we didn't have to go borrow the money from the bank, but we did. And we didn't have to have a four year kind of reevaluation, but we did. And so everybody, so, but he didn't have to sell either. Like he didn't have to complete the succession plan a few years early, but he did. So we, we, we tried to, each person felt like they, they gave up a little bit in order for the benefit of the business. So, right. Well, right. The the perfect measure of a compromise when, when everybody feels like they gave up something. (laughs) So, so I know ultimately like, you wrote a book about this. I guess co-authored a book with with a few others about just this succession planning experience and 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 what it was like. So I'm curious. You know, we'll put a copy of the book in the in the show notes as well. So this is episode ten. If people want to get a copy of the book, they can go to kitsis.com slash ten. But can you talk a little bit about the the book and and what you shared there and and what else you kind of learned through this succession experience? In a lot of ways, the book was therapy for me. So being a successor for our founder is oftentimes a lonely place, as I've talked to a lot, a number of successors, in that, you know, that the founder in many ways is one of your most meaningful mentors, if you've worked with them for a, a, a good period of time. And there's this, there's this launching that occurs much like it happens with a parent and a child when they go off to college or start a, a life of their own. And, and that was one of the loneliest parts of the succession planning was feeling like, you know, this part of the relationship was going to change. And so as, as I was going through the succession planning, and as I've talked about a number of times, I was just doing a ton of research. And so I was doing research about this thing called founder syndrome or founders, founderitis. And I would go out and talk to a number of people that had been mentors of mine. And one of my, kind of mentors from a distance was Tim Coaches uh, of Coaches Fits and then became a Spirient. And Tim and I would have these discussions, uh, not not regularly, like monthly or anything like that, but just periodically. And what I found was there were others like me and there were others like John Henry, meaning Tim was not dissimilar from John Henry from a demographics and life experiences and growing a firm. And 
And then I would talk to others that were a lot like me. And I met another gentleman that was a lot like me in terms of my peer group named Jay Hummel, who had been a consultant who had been, had asked to come in and, and be part of a kind of a succession plan or a president COO of a, a firm that was quite larger than our firm. And he and I developed this conversation because we were introduced through a mutual friend and he and I would have quarterly phone calls and we would just discuss what was hurting, like what was hurting in our firms. This was back in, you know, 2011, 2012. And what we found was we were, we were having sidebar conversations with a lot of people about these same things. So in 2012, uh, 2013, Bob Veery's, Jay and I and Tim had all done different presentations. Like Tim would talk about separating management from ownership and Jay would talk about what it was like to be an operational kind of expert or how to run a firm because of his consulting background. And I would go present at different conferences and talk about what it was like to be the intern that turned into CEO and some of the emotional stories and, and things that I had gone through in mentoring and, you know, career development and career tracks and things like that. And Bob had asked Jay and I to be part of a panel to talk about what it's like to be a successor. And at this conference, Tim was on a panel to be, to talk about what it was like to be a founder. And after the conference, Tim reached out to Bob and said, do you, do you think Jay and Eric are going to do anything with this? What they've been, you know, what they talked about and what they've been doing. And Jay and I had no plans for it. And Tim was like, well, maybe I'll reach out to them and see if they want to actually put something together. And so that started the conversation. And this was in, but this was in the heat of our succession plan. We hadn't even finished it yet. And so what was great was we started kind of drafting concepts for the book and why would we even write a book and what's its purpose? And cause we all had day jobs. And, and what we found out was, is that most of the writing was on the financial pieces of succession, you know, valuations, buyout terms, you know, that, or it was on the operational pieces in terms of, well, you know, how would you design a management team and how would you kind of structure a leadership pipeline for planners? And, but there was very little written about the emotional piece. And so I started just having little, you know, sharing little conversations about this founder syndrome or founder itis or some of the parts of, that we talked about in the book at different conferences and people seemed to like it. So we came up with the idea of we would, we would structure the book around three main areas, operational, financial, and emotional. And we would weave emotional stories into all aspects of the book by interviewing people that had been founders or that had been successors, or there were industry consultants or heads of major RAA or kind of what you'd call like roll up firms or merger acquisition firms and get their perspective in those different areas as a way to share insight into stories that had never been shared in industry publications because it all been about the, the terms or the structure, never about really the emotions or the stories. And so we, we decided to put the book concept together and, and really I would say we, we were, we were reluctant authors, I think, but because there were three of us, uh, we felt like there was a mission for doing the book to share not only our stories, but also to help the founders and successors that were behind us because the demographics were such that so many of the founders of our firms, the firms in our industry weren't addressing it. They were talking about it, but they weren't really ha putting plans into place. And then so many of my peer group or our peer group had been at firms for 10 years or 12 years or 15 years watching kind of the train wreck, you know, on the horizon. And, and so we put the book together. And so the book's called Success and Succession. And it's, it's meant to really unlock, kind of have conversations about how to unlock the value, the power, and then like the potential that these firms have from a successor's point of view by also sharing founder stories that hadn't been shared before. And it was really a lot of fun. And so we, we started drafting pieces of the book and sending it out to different publishers and such. And then Wiley Publishing decided to, to take us on as the project. And we signed the publishing agreement the month after we finished the succession plan here at the firm. And so when I meant that it so was, you were, you were fresh out of the, out of the transaction as you're sitting down to write. Well, and that's why I said it was very therapeutic because the, the book concept was being built the last 18 months of the succession plan that we were orchestrating here at our firm. And as we're, we're, you know, designing chapter outlines, outlines and summaries for the chapters and what the purpose of the book would be, it was really crystallizing why it was a good time for us to go ahead and complete the succession plan here at our firm. And so, you know, so then we signed the publishing agreement, you know, the month that, so July of 14, and then spent the next 12 months writing the book. And then it came out just a little over a year ago. And it's been quite a lot of fun for me because I did it with two people that are really close to me. I mean, one that had been a mentor for many years and then one that had been kind of a confidant and a, a peer sounding board for many years. And so the book is called Success and Succession. So we'll, we'll make sure we've got a, 
I'll link to it up on the site at kitsis.com slash 10. You know, again, the, the thing that's, I think, so impactful to me reading the book really is the, the, the emotional discussions. And, you know, I, I say that as like the nerdy introvert that scores low on empathy. <laughs> like it, it, I mean, I think, I think we often forget, as you said, like there's so much discussion out there about the numbers and the valuation and the math and so little about, you know, what's it's, what's it like when you're a founder and this firm has been part of your identity and then someone asks you to buy it out and give it up and, and, and how do you, how do you walk away from that or, or reconcile that? And, and I mean, likewise from the buyers or from the successors and like, what's it like when you're trying to buy into a firm and take over and how do you have the conversations with the person who kind of functionally still has the power in the relationship because they own the, the the shares or the bulk of the shares. And and you guys talk about that in a way that I think is is really powerful, is really meaningful for for people that are staring down the succession challenge, really from either end. You know, the the I think the book has a lot of relevance for both owners and successors that are coming in, whereas most of the other books out there are really just written for the for the owners, for the for the people that are looking to sell. Well, thank you. That's that was our hope, and to lend to not to not discount the the voice of the founder and make the successor's voice the most important, but to also give them somewhat of an equal billing. And that's what was great about having Tim involved was he he could reach out to many of his counterparts that were in his stage of building really successful firms, and they could share stories that that, that hadn't been that hadn't been told in ways that get, and they're real they're real people. I mean, they, these were. Many of the founders, like John Henry, they they were great at investments, or they're great at relationships, or they're great at financial planning. And all of a sudden, they they do that really well for a number of years, and they have this real enterprise that has value. And and in, and in some ways, the you know part of what I think I would what I would what I would share to founders and successors is that you know there's there's a there's a show that's filmed in my home state called Fixer Upper that's on Home and Garden Home and Garden TV or whatever, and. The, the premise of the show is there are these, these homes that are, you know, 50, 80, 100 years old in some situations that they have great bones and they have great potential, but they've been neglected. Not because anyone wanted to neglect them, but because they just weren't cared for or they weren't updated. And in a lot of ways, that's like our firms uh, in our industry. You know, some of these firms are 30, 40, 50 years old in some extreme cases. Part of what Part of what is in, in, is exciting for kind of the next generation of uh, people that are coming from CFP programs and getting their CFP and going into the industry is that they look at the bones of these firms and say, gosh, if we move that wall and change the carpet and painted that room, wow, how great could this firm be? And so in, in a lot of ways, it's not that they – and I think this is one of the things that I, I heard from a number of founders is part of the fear is – you know, the fear of, of selling the firm is that it's going to be you know, ruined or their legacy is going to be tarnished. and. And in most situations, it's not indifferent to when we go buy a home. Uh, most most people go buy a home not because they want to leave everything the same way it is, which you and I can have a side – you can chime in because it's kind of funny. Most people buy the home because they like the neighborhood. They like the street it's on. They like the way the rooms are laid out. But they want to change the light fixtures and they want to change the flooring and they want to paint a few rooms. And so in a lot of ways, the successor generation, while they may not be as entrepreneurial in the eyes of the founders – they have a lot of those same ideas to come in and improve. They don't. They don't want to scrap everything that's there. They want to take what's there that's that really is working well, and just make it just a little bit more more relevant or more updated or more more that addresses kind of where the the culture is or where the the industry is. And so I think that's the once John Henry I think understood that, and that that was kind of the one of the central points was I'm not going to delete everything that you've done and change everything. That would be foolish for me to do that to risk my to risk this much money on something that I don't to essentially blow it up and start over. And I think, but that's one of the fears that founders have. And I think for successors, one of the things they can take from that is you don't have to go in and change everything. Just change a few things. Just, you know, just change the paint color and the flooring and the, and the light fixtures, so to speak. Meaning you might change a few of the things about how you deliver the service or how you price the service or how you pay your employees from a compensation plan standpoint. But the bones of the firm are likely very good. So the successors, the gap isn't you have to come up, you, have to, you don't have to be a visionary and an entrepreneur and create something totally new. And the founder, you don't have to be afraid that, you know, your legacy is going to be lost and that the firm isn't going to 
because that'd be, those those would be two foolish things to actually to actually act on when you're when you're talking about exchanging you know in some cases right like dollars. when when you're when you're a buyer and you're taking on hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars of debt like I don't want to come in and blow up the firm I'd rather not declare bankruptcy. <laughs> And, and you know, the, the expression that Jahir and I had was, you know, we're in Texas, and so there's a lot of kind of rural kind of blazing trails references. And I said, you know, one of the conversations we had was, you know, Jahir, you blaze the trails. I mean, you blaze the trail for the business, and you, you figured out where the business was going. I came back in and just put pavement on it and made it so that we could do a little bit faster for a little bit longer period of time with a little less wear and tear and impact on the operations. And that's really what – that's the beauty of succession planning in my mind is that not all of them are going to be stories like mine because people tell me it's very unique, but I think there, there is a lot of potential that that's left out there. And so when we were talking about the book and things, we, we came up with this concept of visually of this, this rusted old like barn lock as the image for the book, because in a lot of ways it's, you know, it's, that's like our businesses. They have, maybe they haven't been accessed or really looked at intently on the inside for a while. And a lot of it's just, how do you unlock that? with some of the potential ideas that the next generation has not to wholeheartedly change things, but just on the fringes, you know, little bitty risk it with little bitty small projects in a way that you might end up unlocking, you know, 10, 15, 20% more growth than you had before that then certainly pays for the idea of sharing ownership and engaging others in a meaningful conversation. So as we wrap up here, I'm, I'm curious. So you've had what I think most people externally would call a, a phenomenally successful path from literally being like the, the, the unpaid intern coming into the firm to becoming an owner, becoming a, the manager of the business, ultimately buying out the founder of the business, now operating as its CEO, as you guys cross $5 million of revenue and, and, you know, a couple of years out from a billion dollars under management at your current growth trajectory. So, you know, I, I think successful as most people would classically label it in terms of a c- career progression. But I'm, I'm curious from your end that success often means very different things to different people. So as someone who's built what you've built and done what you've done, like, I'm curious how you reflect back on it. Like, how would you define success at this point? It's a really good question. And it's one that I thought a lot about in that once we, once we finished the succession plan, there was a bit of a grieving process that occurred that I've talked to a number of successors as well as founders about and that, you know, he and I had worked together for 17 and a half years. And like I said, he'd been one of my very first meaningful mentors. And so there was, there was a decompression zone almost that occurred after where I had to look back in the rearview mirror and go, was this the right idea? Like, did this, was this what I really wanted? Is this, is, or is this really what I want? And so there's a little bit of a revaluing of success from that perspective in terms of, okay, now you, now you are the CEO and now you are in control and now you are, you are all the things that you thought you'd wanted to be. And I will, I will tell you, there's a bit of a, a reflection in that that says, gosh, like this, that conquest of, of, of solving succession had really occupied a lot of your time. So when I, when I, when I, what I mean by that is, you know, here's the prize and the prize is to complete the succession plan. And that had been a multi year project that was highly engaged, highly involved, highly emotional. Uh, lots of research, lots of consultants, you know, I mean, it was, it was a wonderful project, right? It was a big, huge science experiment. And then, and then you solved for the drug that would, you know, cure the cancer, right? I mean, then you, 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 you found the drug, you designed the, the, the prescription, and then here it is, and then you complete it. And then all of a sudden you, the, and then you look up and you kind of go, well, wow, that was, that was really time consuming. And I think, so when I, when I think about success for me, it's, you know, the, the book, like I said, was very therapeutic because successful to me was meaning that I could be more of a conduit. The point there is, so I've had this experience and the meaning as the successor, but I've also had this experience as a, as a business owner or building a, you know, investment advisory firm. And what I found after completing the thing with Jai, completing the succession plan with Jahini was I wasn't going to go tackle another big succession plan because it was done. But that had been on my radar for so long. So it, I had to change the, what the mindset of success looked like. And the mindset of success had to become, how could I be a conduit for these experiences? Meaning, I'm that much more motivated to create more opportunities for the employees we don't even have yet, or for the owners that we don't even have yet, or to be involved with founders and, 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 and next generation kind of employees to solve succession for the benefit of clients. And so success has meant, how do I 
how do I create a new leverage of time for me by the way the firm operates, just like I did for John Henry 17 years ago? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. And so, so the kind of, you know, what, what, what drives you for success or what, what, what you're moving towards for achieving success is, is itself a moving target. You know, you, you, I, I used to the analogy earlier, kind of the, the dog that chases the car. And then once, once you actually catch it, you, you, you have this moment of, okay, now what do I do or what's next? And, and like, is that kind of the nature of success? Like you, you'll, you'll keep hitting the waypoints you're shooting for, but then you have to set a new goal for yourself to, to know what you're moving towards next. Well, I don't, I I think of it in some ways that's right. In some ways it's slightly different in that I feel like the experience I've had aren't just for the benefit of this firm. And so success to me is, you know, much like, much like when I showed up with John Henry, I figured out a way to, to create leverage for him. Like he found leverage in me. My, my kind of, kind of direct focus now is, well, how, how can I use the the stories of the book or the stories of our firm or my experiences with clients in terms of training and mentoring here in the firm to to train as well as transition aspects of the things that I've learned so that you know the whole the whole face of the industry. So Jay and I used to joke about this idea of you know changing the face of finance in America, and 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 the idea was you know, we were in our early days of the firm designing what we wanted the firm to be. We'd have these grand ideas, right? And what it's turned into is it's not that we're changing the face of finance for the consumer. It's that I've really found this desire to change the face of finance, I mean, literally. So if the face of the firm is the founder, changing the face of finance in America in a lot of ways is, is replacing that face with either two or three faces, like a whole new management team or a whole new succession team. And so that, that same thing for me, meaning I'm actually working on my succession plan and I'm 42 years old. So trying to identify how to leverage the strengths of, of the owners that we don't even have yet in our firm as a way to prove that as, as, as a way to continue to prove out the experiment, but then also lending my voice to conversations with successors and founders that are stuck. Because I feel like if John Henry hadn't been as open to the conversations that we had early on, I likely would have left after two or three years, which is what a lot of people are doing right now, where they're watching succession plans not occur, meaning you know, the audience is listening. And so they're, you know, they're watching. If there's no communication, they filled in when their own stories is what I will tell founders. And so if the staff isn't hearing a story from you, they're making up their own. In a lot of ways, that story is worse. And, and so people are leaving. There's this, there's this uh, competition for talent, right? And so if you're running a great firm and you're not having a conversation about, about the fact that you really are just an interim CEO. And what I mean by that is we're all interim CEOs. At some point, we won't be the CEO, either because the business fails and it closes, or we don't make it anymore, like we die. And so we're all interim CEOs. And and so having that, sharing those conversations, I, I hope helps the clients of these firms. Because the last thing I want for the clients of our firm or the employees of our firm is to look up one day and realize that Eric held too much control and yes, he made a great living doing it, but when something happened to him, all of it just really went away or the client scattered and we couldn't make good on the promises we had made to service them. And so, so in some ways, that's what success looks like for me now is having the discretion to be more of a conduit for part of the stories that I think have always benefited our firm, but now having it benefit people outside of our firm. Well, I, amen. I'll, uh, we'll have your information about Austin Asset and how people can find you up in the show notes. So again, kitsis.com slash 10 for episode 10 uh, for people who are interested more. And you know, I, I I have a feeling there may be a few founders or successors who who listen to this episode and follow up with you with uh, maybe some further questions or perspectives. So hopefully we'll, we'll give you more of an opportunity to be a, a, a conduit for that message. Well, thank you, Michael. And I, I, and the one thing the audience should know is Michael's been a great friend of mine for, for many years, for more than 10 years. And, and so I appreciate the fact that you've developed a venue where you can have people share their stories and, and give the, the audience a way to kind of see themselves in those stories. So thank you for doing that. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits 
along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.